Laboratory for the ear. Learning objectives for the ear. 1. Be able to recognize and describe the major subcomponents of the vestibular labyrinth, that is, the semicircular canals, utricle, and saccule. Number 2. Be able to recognize and describe the histological details of the cochlea and the organ of corti. The ear is subdivided into the external ear, which receives and directs sound waves from the external environment, the middle ear, which transforms sound waves into mechanical vibrations, and the inner ear, where these mechanical vibrations are converted to nerve impulses and relayed to the brain to be interpreted as sound. The inner ear also contains the vestibular organs that function in balance. The external ear consists of two basic portions, the auricle or pinea and the external auditory meatus. The auricle or pinea of the external ear is shown here. At its core is an irregularly shaped uh, plate of elastic cartilage that gives the external ear or pinea its form and it is overlaid by a typical thin skin to which it is tightly uh, adherent. That is, the skin is tightly adherent to the perichondrium of the elastic cartilage. The thin skin uh, contains scattered small vellus hairs, their associated sebaceous glands, and occasional uh, sweat glands. The external auditory meatus, the second portion of the external ear, is about two and a half centimeters long, and unlike this line diagram, follows an open S-shaped course. It consists of an outer part whose uh, walls are made up of elastic cartilage, which are continuous with those of the uh, auricle, and the inner wall of the external auditory meatus is made up of temporal bone. The external auditory meatus is lined by a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that is continuous with the epidermis of the auricle. The epithelium is firmly anchored to the surrounding perichondrium or periosteum uh, by a dense collagenous connective tissue. Small hairs are present in the epithelium on the outer part of the meatus and are associated with relatively large sebaceous glands. A special form of coiled apocrine sweat gland, the ceruminous gland, occurs uh, in the skin and is scattered uh, throughout the lining epithelium of the external uh, auditory meatus. It's the secretory product of these specialized uh, apocrine uh, sweat glands. Remember, these are simple coiled tubular glands that produce the product known as cerumen, a waxy material that prevents the drying of skin that lines the external auditory uh, meatus. The so-called middle ear consists of a tympanic cavity, the auditory ossicles, two skeletal muscles known as the tensor tympani and stapedius muscles, the auditory or eustachian tube, and the tympanic membrane. The tympanic cavity is an irregularly shaped space in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. It is continuous anteriorly with the auditory or eustachian tube and posteriorly with mastoid air cells, which are not shown in this particular diagram. The wa lateral wall consists chiefly of the tympanic membrane or eardrum, which forms a partition separating the tympanic cavity from the external auditory meatus. The inner uh, bony wall of the middle ear makes contact with the inner ear via two small membrane-covered openings called the oval and round windows. 
The membrane of the oval window contains the base of an auditory ossicle, the stapes. The membrane that covers the round window, which isn't shown here, is referred to as the secondary tympanic membrane. The tympanic cavity contains the auditory ossicle, a chain of three bones, the malus, the incus, and the stapes, that unite the tympanic membrane of the middle ear with the oval window of the inner ear. The ossicles consist of compact bone and are united by small synovial joints. The bones are suspended in the air-filled tympanic cavity by thin strands of connective tissue referred to as ligaments. Two small skeletal muscles, the tensor tympani and the stapedius, are associated with two of the ossicles. The tendon of the tensor tympani attaches to the malleus, and the tendon of the stapedius attaches to the stapes. The bulk of the skeletal muscles themselves are contained within small canals in the temporal bone. The auditory ossicles, their suspending ligaments, and the inner walls of the tympanic cavity are covered by a thin mucous membrane that consists of a simple squamous type of epithelium uh, uh, supported by a delicate connective tissue. The mucous membrane of the middle ear cavity is firmly attached to the periosteum of the temporal bone, lines the interior of the mastoid air cells, and covers the inner surface of the tympanic membrane. It joins the auditory tube or eustachian tube. The lining epithelium becomes ciliated columnar interspersed with secretory cells. The auditory or eustachian tube is about four centimeters uh, in length and connects the anterior part of the tympanic cavity with the nasopharynx. Near the tympanic cavity, the supporting wall consists of compact bone, as one would anticipate, whereas the medial two-thirds, the auditory tube is supported by J-shaped pieces of elastic uh, cartilage. The bony portion is lined by a simple columnar epithelium beca but becomes ciliated pseudostratified columnar in the collagenous part. Cilia beat towards the pharynx in the ciliated type of epithelium and goblet cells are present primarily near the pharyngeal uh, opening. The inner ear, as shown here at the uh, tip of the arrow, consists of a system of canals and cavities within the petreous portion of the temporal bone. The compact bone surrounding the canals and cavities forms the bony labyrinth and is filled with a fluid called perilymph. A series of fluid-filled uh, membranous structures, collectively called the membranous labyrinth, lie suspended within this perilymph. The membranous labyrinth is filled with endolymph, a fluid within an ionic uh, composition similar to that of intracellular fluid, being rich in potassium ions and low in sodium uh, ions. The bony and membranous labyrinths consist of two major subcomponents, a vestibular labyrinth which is uh, shown at this location, which con uh, contains the sensory elements for equilibrium, and the cochlea, which contains the sensory structures for hearing. This is a demonstration of the three auditory ossicles that have been laminated and put on a card for examination by uh, students. One can get an idea of their size by looking at the writing which is shown here and some of the arrows drawn by uh, a, a pen. Nonetheless, even though they are under or, uh, sort of a lamination sheet, one can appreciate not only their size uh, but the shapes of these 
little compact uh, bony structures. This is the malleus here, as indicated by this arrow, the moving arrow, the incus, and then of course the stapes, which has that little stirrup-like uh, arrangement to its uh, structure. So these are the three auditory ossicles uh, from a human being that have been dissected out and laminated on a card uh, for demonstration. This particular figure is an illustration showing the inner surface of the eardrum. Uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph. One can make out the what, the first ossicle, the malleus, and this is a segment of bone coming up uh, to the inner surface of the eardrum. Uh, this is the manubrium of the malleus. The rest of the malleus is uh, down at this particular location. One can see the a bit of the mucous membrane. Remember, this is a simple squamous type of epithelium overlying the inner surface of the eardrum and overlying this portion of the ossicle. One can see a, a tiny fold here. Now the connective tissue components making up the interior of the eardrum, which is shown here, insert into a fibrocartilage ring that surrounds the eardrum itself, and that in turn will link uh, into the uh, surrounding bone. So this is simply a scanning electron micrograph showing you the inner surface of the eardrum, that surface, and the manubrium of the malleus uh, extending up uh, along the inner surface of the eardrum and is being covered uh, by a mucous membrane, uh, except for around here it's been disrupted and torn off a little bit, which allows its visualization perhaps a little bit better. This is a view of the wall of the middle ear cavity facing the medial surface. This is the bony wall, so the inner ear mechanism would be behind and within this particular bony wall of the uh, temporal bone. And what this particular illustration shows, which is a scanning electron micrograph courtesy of Professor Dunkerley of the Department of Anatomy, University of Missouri, is this structure here. This is the oval window as seen viewing from the interior of the middle ear cavity, looking again towards that medial surface. And what this figure shows is the stapes. This is the articulating joint that would be uh, joining uh, through a little synovial joint with the incus. So this is the top of the uh, stapes. This is the stapes going in either direction. And the foot plate is down in this area. And this region here is the region of the oval window that receives the foot plate of the stapes. Uh, so this is a, a scanning electron micrograph that beautifully demonstrates the relationship of the oval window uh, to that of the stapes. This particular figure is a scanning electron micrograph courtesy of Professor Dunkerley, Department of Anatomy. What this particular scanning electron micrograph shows is the stapes as viewed from the interior of the middle ear cavity. The stapes, that is the bone itself, runs in this direction and one can see one part of the stirrup going this way, another part of the bone angling this way with the concavity uh, being here. Remember, this was taken in situ within the inner ear cavity. So this is the covering mucous membrane that's going over the top or around the uh, stapes itself, and then reflecting on other structures within the middle ear cavity. The base of the stirrup would be down in this region here, as indicated by the arrow, and would be the position of the oval window. This broken, or so it appears, area here is actually the open synovial joint, uh, that contact point that the 
um, stapes has with the Incas. Remember, these three small bones are linked to one another through synovial joints. And so this synovial joint has been opened up. You can see a little bit of the capsule here that's uh, showing up a little bit brighter. So this is simply a picture of the uh, stapes. That inner ossicle bone, inner ear ossicle bone, that will join or link the tympanic membrane with its two others uh, to the oval window which this particular bone fits into uh, as indicated here by the arrow. Perhaps it would be a little bit better illustrated here in white so we can see. But nonetheless this is a very interesting view. The stapes uh, covered by its overlying mucous membrane. This is simply the region of a portion of a dissected skull showing the opening to the external auditory meatus as indicated here at the pointer going into this portion of the uh, temporal bone. This is a dissected portion of the uh, skull. Zygomatic process base is located here and this region here is once again showing the opening of the external auditory meatus, that is the bony portion. The mastoid process of the skull is at this particular uh, location. Now if one directs their attention and looks into the interior of the external auditory meatus, one can see the uh, manubrium of the malleus uh, and its position within this particular uh, dissected uh, skull. The uh, membrane that they have it uh, within is, of course, transparent. But this gives one uh, somewhat of a location. Now we will turn the specimen over and look at its interior. It will be unfolded in half uh, via these hinges, and we're going to look at the interior where this has been split on the other side uh, to see the ossicles of the ear and the relationship perhaps to the two uh, muscles associated with the ear ossicles, the tensor tympani and stapedius muscles. We are now looking at the inner surface of the middle ear cavity which has been split open. So this is the previous sample where we looked at it from the outside but now it has been split open. This shiny membrane is the artist's depiction or what they filled in to uh, resemble the eardrum itself. These are mastoid air cells up, up in this particular region. And what this illustration shows is the manubrium of the malleus going up into the eardrum as indicated by the tip of the pointer. This ossicle shown here is the incus that is uh, attached to the malleus by a synovial joint. And also shown uh, here is the position of the tensor tympani within this little tube of bone. These muscles are a little bit less than the size of a straw in diameter. And they fit into little tubes within the temporal bone. Their tendons exit and enter the uh, middle ear cavity. And the case of the tensor tympani is going to attach to the uh, malleus. This is the other half of that particular specimen, illustrating a portion of the middle ear cavity. And what this particular uh, half shows is the stapes located here, this little foot stirrup here, as you can see. And also associated with it, the artists have put in the position of the stapedius muscle, which was running here. And it's been opened up, of course, to uh, in this little concavity where the uh, muscle would originally lie has been uh, filled in. And like the tensor tympani, it lines with, lies within a little uh, tubular portion of the bone with its tendon exiting out and then attaching to the uh, stapes. So this is the other half showing a portion of that middle ear cavity uh, showing the relationship between the stapedius 
muscle and the stapes. This is that dissected skull once again showing additional features in further dissection of the skull itself. This orifice as indicated by the pointer is the external auditory meatus or that bony portion that's emptying or entering the temporal portion of the uh, bone of the skull. Much of the mastoid region of the temporal bone has been dissected free and one can see if one looks down into this portion of the temporal bone as they have colored in the angles taken by the semicircular canals. One is shown here, another here, and one right at the exact tip of the pointer that's coming at, out at the viewer. Uh, this region of thin bone here is the outer surface, surface of some of the uh, mastoid uh, air cells. So they would be located if this shell were a bone were broken through. Styloid process is uh, located here and of course here's the remainder of the upper jaw. This would be the uh, posterior aspect of the skull. So this is a further dissection immediately adjacent to the external auditory meatus going into the temporal bone to showing uh, some elements of the inner ear. In this particular case, the semicircular canals of that vestibular component. This is a region of that dissected skull looking at the interior of the skull. The brain, of course, is removed. This would be the outer lateral surface. This is posterior here with the foramen magnum located at this particular location. Though it's difficult to perceive, this is the petreous portion of the temporal bone which is actually projecting out toward the viewer. It is within this region here of this petreous portion of the temporal bone that is where the elements of the inner ear are located. A further look at the dissected uh, specimen at increased magnification a small portion or dissected portion of the petreous portion of the temporal bone. So some interesting features. Colored in blue and curving in this particular direction illustrates one of the semicircular canals. So the other three are located in this immediate vicinity. This dissected specimen also shows, if one can direct their attention to here, one of the spirals or turns or curves of the cochlea. So the cochlea and its location have been partially dissected and are illustrated here as well. Both of these elements, the semicircular canals uh, and other subcomponents make up the vestibulary and it's located in this region of the petreous portion of the temporal bone. The cochlea also located immediately adjacent to it is also found in the petreous portion of the temporal bone. This particular figure represents a line drawing of the membranous labyrinth. Please recall that the membranous labyrinth itself, that structure that is shown here, lies suspended within the fluid-filled cavity, that fluid, fluid being perilymph, and it's suspended in the perilymph by uh, connective tissue trabeculae which are small extensions from the periosteum of the bone that anchor to the external surface of this membranous structure and suspend it three-dimensionally in this perilymph fluid. Now surrounding the perilymph in that little bit of periosteum where these trabeculae are extending from is the surrounding bony labyrinth. The bony labyrinth is simply a rind of bone uh, a portion of that petreous portion of the temporal bone that lies immediately adjacent to uh, the shape of these structures in the membranous labyrinth. So the bony labyrinth would occupy a thin shell of bone at the periphery occupying a position right where the tip of the arrow now is and extending from its uh, periosteum from that bony labyrinth it will attach to this membranous labyrinth and hold it 
uh, in space, or as it were, or hold it in position and uh, between the bone and the membranous labyrinth is this perilymph uh, fluid. So it's suspended within that, but yet surrounded uh, within this uh, bony labyrinth, which will have the very same name structures as shown here uh, in the membranous labyrinth, the functional part. Nonetheless, this uh, line drawing shows you the membranous labyrinth as it would have looked if dissected three. There are shown in the vestibular portion, uh, this portion is now indicated by the arrow, three semicircular canals, a utricle in which these canals uh, sort of join, and then another small membranous bulge here in the uh, membranous labyrinth uh, called the saccule. Now within each one of these, i.e. the saccule, the utricle, and the three semicircular canals, there's a modified portion of the epithelium that lines these chambers uh, that contains sensory cells. There's a bulge in each one of the semicircular uh, canals which is called the ampulla. And it's within the ampulla of these semicircular canals, all three of them, uh, this expanded portion that some of the sensory receptors will be located. That is, they will be located there. So the ampulla uh, of the semicircular canal here shows this in stippled form. This is where the sensory cells will be. The other group of sensory cells in this semicircular canal will be located in the ampulla here. And for this particular semicircular canal, the ampulla will be located at this location. These sensory areas are referred to as Christi. And we'll sh see some actual preparations or actual uh, Christi in a moment. These larger patches having uh, containing similar sensory cells in the uh, utricle and the saccule are referred to as the maculae. So these are uh, large sensory areas that also are going to uh, detect uh, gravity and linear acceleration. These are the areas where the sensory elements are located within this uh, membranous labyrinth. This structure here in the snail shell configuration, so it's difficult to visualize uh, here, uh, is the cochlea. It will also contain sensory hairs, and it's part of this membranous labyrinth, but rather than equilibrium uh, acceleration and that what have you from that uh, point of view, this particular membranous portion of the uh, membranous labyrinth is going to be involved uh, solely in uh, hearing. The sensory mechanism uh, actually lies within the cochlea, and it's an organization uh, known as the organ of corti that will lie within this cochlear duct. The sensory epithelium of the Christi and maculae consists of type 1 and type 2 sensory hair cells and supporting sustentacular cells. The type 1 hair cell is flash-shaped with a narrow apical region and a rounded base that contains the nucleus. A large part of the cell is enveloped in a cup-like afferent nerve ending or calyx. The apical cell membrane of type 1 hair cells bears up to between 50 and 100 large specialized microvilli. The microvilli progressively increase in height from one, one micron on one side to about 100 microns on the opposite side of the cell. A single eccentrically placed cilium is present at the apical surface. Uh, <clears throat> this cilium is believed to be non-motile and is often referred to as a kinocilium. The, <clears throat> the type 2 hair cells are simple columnar cells surrounded by numerous afferent and efferent 
nerve endings rather than by a single afferent nerve ending as seen surrounding the type 1 hair cells. The type 2 hair cells also bear a single eccentrically placed non-motile cilium or kinocilium and 50 to 100 uh, large microvilli that are arranged identically to those located on type 1 hair cells. This scanning electron micrograph is also courtesy of Professor H. Engstrom and what it demonstrates is the apices of two or three adjacent vestibular hair cells showing you the microvilli on the tops of uh, two of these cells as well as that adjacent single elongated kinocilium. One shown here, one is shown about here. So this region as being traced by the pointer is the apical portion of one of the vestibular hair cells. The other one is shown here and out of the field of view we have another one coming in. There would be one down at the bottom and down at the top. So this just gives one a view of these sort of sensory receptors, however they're working, showing you the microvilli and that single kinocilium extending from the apical cell membrane of the vestibular hair cells. This is a region through the vestibular uh, portion of the inner ear and what it is is a cross section through one of the semicircular canals. What one can visualize, probably about the width of the arrow, is where the bony labyrinth would be located, that name portion, and suspended within the cavity of this bony labyrinth, one can see the uh, membranous portion. So this would be the uh, membranous portion uh, labyrinth shown here. This membrane is lined by a simple squamous epithelium and occasionally it will uh, sort of cube up uh, probably a little bit due to the angle of the section. For some reason it's pushed towards this bony surface because in fact the membranous labyrinth actually lies suspended by this very delicate connective tissue network uh, within the bony labyrinth here. It's sort of suspended within this cavity and the, this is this connective tissue, this mesenchymal looking type of tissue, this sort of spider tree strandy type. These are the so-called ligaments that attach to the exterior surface of the membranous labyrinth and hold it in space within this cavity. It is within this space here that the perilymph will percolate. So this is a perilymphatic space as we, uh, in contrast to the interior of the uh, membranous labyrinth where the arrow now resides, which will contain the endolymph. So this is a view of the what the uh, histological appearance of the membranous labyrinth would appear as through the vast majority of its structure. Now, in certain regions, that is the ampullae of the semicircular canals and the maculae of the utricle and saccule, in those regions, the epithelium will change and form the sensory apparatus. But by and large, the majority of the membranous labyrinth is lined by this simple squamous to cuboidal type of epithelium and shows uh, this type of a framework a small membranous epithelial line tube uh, and, and it's suspended within the bone and surrounded by perilymph and yet uh, it's aided in its suspension by attaching via this connective tissue to the uh, actual bone which would be almost like a periosteum but extraordinarily thin. Now if we course down this bone and we're tangentially cutting along the semicircular canal. Uh, so this is uh, sort of the bony labyrinth but seen in sort of a, a tangential cut. 
Well, then uh, it'll open up again into the ampular region. We can now see the lining epithelium once again of the semicircular canal. These are these suspensory ligaments. So this chamber here is going to be filled with endolymph. Perilymph will be percolating uh, through these uh, connective tissue strands. The reason it's expanded is because we've now entered a uh, ampullae of one of the semicircular canals. And one can see how the Christi, so this is the Christi here, this mound or elevation extending across uh, and into the endolymph of the semicircular canal. So this is the membranous labyrinth shown a little bit better here. It's supporting and sort of uh, connective tissue lying here. The epithelial lining, it changes into the sensory type here and then goes back to the simple form uh, shown here. One can visualize here perhaps a little bit better the bony labyrinth, that surrounding rhino bone, which is this area here. And one can see a sort of a line of demarcation that goes uh, in this particular direction. So this is the Christi ampullaris, the sensory region of one of the semicircular canals. The sensory epithelium, along with supporting cells, will lie in this area. This region here, called the planum semilutanum, uh, is an, a region of supporting cells which then fizzles out. One can see this region start here and then fizzles out to a simple squamous type here. These are supporting cells, the functional uh, aspects of which are poorly understood. In addition to the connective tissue, the delicate connective tissue forming the core of these uh, Christi ampullaries, there will be numerous unmyelinated nerve fibers, both afferent and efferent fibers, and then they will uh, exit this region. You can see them going through this sort of spongy uh, network of bone to exit this particular system. So if we go down and view the Christi ampullaris, one should be able to make out some of the sensory cells as well as some of the supporting cells. This area here is known as the cupula. It's a complex proteoglycan type of material. The majority of the cupula is gone, however. It will form a band or a projection off the top of these Christi that will extend maybe two-thirds or three-fourths of the way across the uh, interior of the canal of the uh, the ampular region of the semicircular canal. So this is the Christi ampullaris of a semicircular canal as seen at a relatively uh, low magnification. This is the apex of the Christi ampullaris of a semicircular canal as seen at high magnification. It's a very thick section, obviously, so it appears a little bit uh, uh, soft. But one can make out these large, empty, bulb-like cells sort of running high within the epithelium, and as indicated by the pointer, these large, empty, bulb-shaped cells are type 1 hair cells that will actually lie in a, are surrounded at their base by a nerve known as the calyx, or an expansion of a nerve process. But most of that can only be visualized with the electron microscope. So what one can view and see on this particular section are type 1 hair cells, these large empty bulb shaped cells. Uh, type 1 cells cannot, or type, excuse me, type 2 hair cells cannot be seen crisply for sure. And also placed in between uh, the two uh, sensory cells, that is type 1, which are shown here, and type 2 hair cells are sustentacular cells. That perhaps are these little narrow ones uh, that are supporting cells uh, within this uh, Christi ampullaris. One can uh, visualize a little bit uh, a portion of the forming cupula, that proteoglycan type mural that 
material that forms a large windshield wiper type structure that extends across uh, the lumen of the semicircular canal is actually moved by the movement of the endolymph, which in turn stimulates these uh, hair cells. The only ones we can really say for sure are the type 1 hair cells as indicated by the tip of the pointer. This material here is unmyelinated nerve fibers coming from those uh, and to and from uh, the hair cells uh, of the Christi ampullaris. And these cells down in this region here are the supporting cells of the phantom uh, Planum semilutanum uh, that, of course, will uh, then blend off and become more of a simple squamous uh, type as one gets to the exterior of the Christi area. And that's shown here. This particular figure represents a scanning uh, view uh, through the microscope through the ampulla of a semicircular canal this large expanse being the ampulla. One can see the membranous labyrinth, the simple squamous to cuboidal type of epithelium that lines the majority of the membranous labyrinth and how it's anchored down once again by that connective tissue ligaments that attach to the surrounding uh, bony labyrinth. Also shown in this ampular region is the Christi. This little mound of sensory cells here with its supporting uh, type 1 and type 2 hair cells. The reason for demonstrating this particular uh, figure at low power is to show it's the relationship of the Christi and the sensory epithelium to the overlying cupula, which is shown here and comes up about in this fashion as illustrated by the arrow. Uh, this is that proteoglycan type of material that extends perhaps in life about uh, to where the arrow now indicates across the ampular region of the semicircular canal. So this is a rather a fairly decent example of the cupula and its relationship to the underlying sensory epithelium of the Christi. This is simply an additional example of a crispy, uh, Christi ampullaris or a Christi as seen at a slight increase in magnification. Simply to illustrate once again that cupula, that proteoglycan type of uh, material and its association with the underlying sensory uh, epithelium, the type 1 and the type 2 hair cells. Uh, it shows quite well the overall shape though not as dramatic as the low power of the first one, but one can get a good idea of the relationship between the cupula with the underlying sensory uh, cells uh, of the Christi. This particular field represents another region uh, or section to the petrous portion of the temporal bone showing the membranous labyrinth. In this particular case, we are approaching a utricle, or we're in the chamber of the utricle, and what we're approaching here now is the change in the epithelium, going once again from a simple squamous form with its underlying and supporting and suspending uh, connective tissue strands to the sensory region of the utricle, a macula. And that is what's shown now and is being crossed within the field of view. The maculae, like the uh, Christi of the semicircular canals, will consist of a sensory epithelium that is made up of type 1 and type 2 hair cells, those would be the sensory elements, plus uh, supporting or sustentacular cells. Now, as we course along this particular membrane, one can see it's a quite a bit larger, more of a flattened type structure. Indeed, in case of the macula of the utricle, it occupies an area perhaps about uh, two uh, millimeters square. So it's a little patch of this sensory uh, form of epithelium. And this is just an overall view uh, taken with the medium power objective 
of this particular uh, structure. As in the Christie, the uh, underlying uh, strands of connective tissue also have incorporated into them unmyelinated nerve fibers, which are, of course are going to come up and innervate uh, and, uh, the uh, type 1 and type 2 hair cells. So this darker, more strandy type of appearance one sees along the tip of the arrow are uh, unmyelinated uh, nerve fibers that are coming in uh, to this particular field. So that one must be aware of that. It's pulled off here a little bit, but one can see a little bit better perhaps the organization of the nerve fibers uh, running in the uh, connective tissue just beneath this sensory type of uh, epithelium. Once again, to repeat, this would be a for endolymph here and then the perilymph percolating between these thin uh, connective tissue strands. This is a region of the macula of the utricle seeing that increased magnification showing the sensory epithelium as indicated by the arrow. The one cell type that can be identified with some degree of certainty is the large bulbous uh, type 1 hair cells which are going to appear very much or identical to those that were seen in the Christi ampullaris uh, region, the sensory region of the semicircular canals. So these light bulb flask shaped cells are the type 1, ha are, uh, type one hair cells. Type two hair cells, though present, cannot be discerned with certainty, nor can the sustentacular cells. Uh, they are thought to be these narrower ones that are lying in between the large bulbous ones. The nerve fibers can be seen perhaps a little bit better beneath the uh, sensory epithelium, and one can make out the uh, otolithic membrane that is again made up of a polysaccharide or a uh, complex proteoglycan type of material uh, here. Remember the apices of the hair cells will extend into the base of this uh, uh, gelatinous type of material. Now in addition to the, that type of material, on the top of the otolithic uh, membrane are the otoliths or the otoconia. On top of this otolithic membrane are the otoconia or otoliths. These uh, little crystalline structures consist of uh, protein and calcium carbonate and sort of form a crystalline type of uh, uh, structure. Uh, so these also are part of the uh, otolithic membrane and, and contribute uh, to its function. Simply passing along the width of this particular structure, some debris there, just to give a good view of this particular sensory region of the utricle. This is the macula as seen at increased uh, magnification. This region here looks fairly uh, decent. One can see large otoliths or otoconia scattered here uh, quite well, as well as the type 1 hair cells, these bulbous empty structures. And once again, the type 2 hair cells or the sustentacular cells cannot be made or differentiated with any degree of certainty at this point. The otoconia continue to be quite spectacular. And then finally we get out into a replacement area of purely supporting cells which will eventually transition once again into the simple squamous uh, form of epithelium. So this is the maculae of a utricle as seen at increased magnification. This is another scanning electron micrograph courtesy of Professor H. Engstrom of Uppsala, Sweden. And what this micrograph simply demonstrates are the otoconia 
these large boulder looking like structures as seen with the scanning electron microscope. So these otoconia are actually on an otolithic membrane uh, from one of the maculae. And it just shows their huge, large uh, crystalline structure. This particular uh, scanning electron micrograph is courtesy of Professor M. Lenoir of Montpellier, Montpellier, France. This particular illustration is a dissected cochlea showing you the spiral nature of this particular uh, organ, receptor. The inner bony pillar, which would lie back in the background, is the location of the uh, modiolus. Like the vestibular portion of the inner ear, the cochlea consists of an outer portion of compact bone and a an central membranous part contained in the perilymph. The osseous part of the cochlea spirals for about two and three-fourths turns about a cone-shaped axis of spongy bone called the modiolus. Blood vessels, nerve fibers, and perikarya of afferent bipolar neurons, uh, known as the spiral ganglia, lie within the substance of this uh, modiolus. A projection of bone, uh, known as the spiral lamina, would be uh, right here. So that's the spiral lamina extends from the uh, modiolus into the lumen of the cochlear canal along its entire course. A fibrous uh, structure known as the basilar membrane, which is the, uh, this membrane uh, right as indicated by the arrow, extends from the spiral lamina, extending from the modiolus, to a spiral ligament, which is shown, not shown over here, but it extends here. And the spiral ligament's a thickening of the periosteum, the outer bony wall of the cochlear canal. Now, a thin vestibular membrane extends obliquely across the cochlear canal uh, from the spiral lamina once again to the outer wall of the uh, cochlea, which is shown here. So you see what's being developed here is sort of a two membranes, the basilar membrane and the vestibular membrane are subdividing this uh, cochlear canal into three different regions. A upper scale of vestibuli, an intermediate cochlear duct. Now this is a cochlear duct, not a cochlear canal. The whole thing is the cochlear canal. And the lower part is the scala tympani. Now the cochlear duct here is part of the endolymphatic uh, system, whereas the scala vestibuli and scala tympani contain perilymph. It is within the cochlear duct, this triangular centrally positioned space, that will contain the sensory apparatus for hearing, known as the organ of corti, which is located at this particular position, as indicated by the arrow. Now, the region of the cochlear duct, uh, known as the stria vascularis, as is shown here, is a uh, rather unusual epithelium because it contains intraepithelial capillaries, that is, capillaries lie within the epithelium, and it's this region of the cochlear duct, that is the stria vascularis, that is thought to be involved in the production of endolymph. The cochlear duct contains a region of specialized cells, the organ of corti, that transforms vibrations of the basilar membrane into nerve impulses. The avascular organ of corti extends along the entire length of the cochlear duct 
and lies on its basilar membrane. It consists mainly of supporting and hair cells. Supporting cells consist of the following cell types, inner and outer pillar cells, inner and outer phalangeal cells, border cells, cells of Henson, and the cells of Claudius. The inner and outer pillar cells forms the, form the boundary of the inner tunnel, as indicated at the pointer, a space that lies within and extends along the entire length of the organ of uh, Cordy. In addition to forming the uh, boundaries to the inner tunnel, the inner and outer pillar cells seem to provide uh, structural support to the adjacent cells within the organ of Cordy. The phalangeal cells serve as supporting elements for the sensory hair cells. The inner phalangeal cell, as shown at the arrow, form a single row of cells immediately adjacent uh, to the inner pillar cells and surround sensory inner hair cells, except at their apical uh, regions. In contrast, the columnar uh, cell type that form the outer phalangeal cells, as indicated here, form three or four rows and support the outer hair cells, as now indicated uh, by the pointer, which are arranged in rows. The apex of each outer phalangeal cell forms a cup-like structure that surrounds the basal third or so of each one of the outer hair cells. Both afferent and efferent nerves are located uh, somewhere along the base of these cells. Each outer phalangeal cell gives rise to a slender uh, cytoplasmic process as indicated uh, here by the arrow that is filled with microtubules. This process extends to the surface where it expands into a uh, flat plate and it's then attached to the uh, apical edges of the outer hair cells and uh, it will be support, provide a support for this particular area. The apical plates of the outer phalangeal cells provide additional support for the outer hair cells, uh, the upper two-thirds of which are not supported by the adjacent cells, instead are surrounded by a fluid-filled uh, intracellular spaces. The fluid contained within these sp uh, spaces is believed to be similar to that of the uh, inner tunnel. The cells of Hansen, which are shown in this particular area, and the cells of Claudius, which would lie and are not shown in this particular uh, field, are additional supporting cells that fill out uh, this organ of Corte. Their functional significance, other than general support, is unknown. This particular illustration <coughs> is a scanning electron micrograph of the organ of Corte, uh, courtesy of Professor H. Engstrom. This particular scanning electron micrograph shows, as this region here is indicated by the arrow, is the region of the inner tunnel. One can also see the apices, the microvilli forming a line uh, as indicated by the arrow. These are the inner hair cells, or at least their microvilli and apices. <laughs> In contrast, these three rows shown here, again of the apical microvilli, are from the outer hair cells. The cell body of an outer hair cell is shown at this particular location. Another is shown here, whereas these long columnar shaped cells or the external surface are the outer phalangeal cells.
Careful observation will also show the outer phalangeal processes, that is, those processes coming up and branching from the phalangeal cells that come up in, and form this apical plate or membrane that holds the very tops of the hair cells. Remember, this cell body of the outer uh, hair cell is being held in sort of three-dimensional space. This is all surrounded by fluid, these chambers, except for its basal one-third that in which it sort of sits in a little cup-like structure of the outer phalangeal cell. So in order to hold its, the apices of these cells all together and keep them supported, these little processes come up, expand into this particular plate. Uh, and then, of course, lying upon this and has been removed is the tectatorial membrane, and it's going to have a shearing effect as that uh, basilar membrane, which the organ of Cordy sits upon, moves. And so you need some firm support for the very tops of these uh, outer and inner hair cells, for that matter. Nonetheless, this is a, a dramatic scanning electron micrograph showing some of the details of the organ of Cordy, and in particular, the arrangement of the microvilli sticking of the hair cells, both the uh, inner and outer, and how they uh, sort of penetrate and go stick beyond that uh, plate established by the phalangeal cells. This is another scanning electron micrograph courtesy of Professor M. Lenore of the University of Montpelier, Montpelier, France. What it demonstrates is the surface of the organ of Cordy, and it shows the demonstration of microvilli belonging to the inner hair cells, which are being now indicated by the arrow. And then the arrangement of the outer hair cells, which are shown, the cells are in uh, three rows, as indicated by the uh, pointer. And the microvilli on the apices of these particular hair cells have this V-shaped configuration. So these would be the tops of the inner hair cells. These are of the outer hair cells. And what is interesting on this, uh, this particular view, viewing from the top, one can make out the processes from the phalangeal cells that will then come up and fuse together into this plate that holds the apices of adjacent cells tightly, t or hair cells tightly together. So this would be the apical region of a hair cell. This is probably the expanded portion of that process coming from down here that expands up at the top and then will unite with several uh, adjacent hair cells, or at least three, and then give the tops of these cells adjacent support. Because if one will recall, the upper third or so of these cells are not surrounded and not supported by uh, anything. They are enveloped in fluid. And so this is a rather delicate yet strange arrangement that works in this particular hearing mechanism. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the tectatorial membrane and portion of the organ of cor uh, corte courtesy of Professor M. Lenore of University of Montpelier, uh, Montpelier, France. What this particular illustration demonstrates is the tectatorial membrane, which is shown here and occupying most of the field of view. And if one lifts up the uh, tectatorial membrane as demonstrated here, where it's uh, pulled up just slightly, one can make out the apices of three rows of the outer hair cells. 
And there are, of course, associated microvilli, which uh, grabs one's attention. Also shown in this particular field is another, or the tops of another form of supporting cell. These are the cells of Hansen, as uh, indicated by the arrow. So each one of these mounds represents the uh, apical region on one of these tall columnar supporting cells, the cells of Hansen. So this is a beautiful scanning electron micrograph showing you the relationship of the tectorial membrane as to the hair cells and other cells of the underlying organ of corti. This is a section through the cochlea of the uh, inner ear and occupying the entire center of the field of view as seen with the uh, scanning objective uh, at low power. With this section through the long axis of the cochlea uh, demonstrate quite well are the following uh, structures. The central region of the cochlear area is filled with a type of uh, sort of spongy bone. This is referred to as the modiolus. Contained within the bony structure of this modiolus or core uh, that the cochlea itself wraps around for two and three quarters turns, one will find the uh, spiral ganglia. These are bipolar uh, neurons and are now indicated by the arrow, sometimes referred to as the spiral ganglia of uh, Cordae. Also shown is a projection of bone that extends out uh, laterally here and here, for example, but courses around the turn. This is referred to as the uh, spiral lamina. It's from the spiral lamina that a fibrous structure known as the basilar membrane extends. Would be, this is it here at the tip of the arrow, uh, subdividing the uh, cochlear canal. Also coming from the spiral laminar area is a thin membrane here. This is, would be called the vestibular membrane. And these two membranes, the basilar membrane and the vestibular membrane, subdivide the cochlear canal into the scale of vestibuli, which is shown here, the cochlear duct, which is shown here and contains the organ of cordae at the tip of the arrow, and then finally the scale of tympani located here. And this type of organization repeats itself over and over again uh, throughout the course of the spiral, which runs uh, roughly uh, two and three quarters turns. To repeat once again, the spiral lamina would be coming off, the, and is this projection of bone here, uh, coming off the modiolus. It extends off its apex here, a basilar membrane, which supports the organ of cordy, which is located here, and also extending from it is the uh, vestibular membrane, shown at the tip of the arrow, and these two membranes subdivide the cochlear canal, this entire structure, into a scale of vestibuli, the cochlear duct, and the scala tympani. The scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, vestibuli tympani, contain the perilymph, the cochlear duct, is filled with endolymph. It should also be recalled that at the apex of the cochlea here, this is referred to as the helicotrema, and it's where the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani uh, become continuous. 
Now at the base of the cochlea, the scale of tympani, as indicated by the arrow, is closed by the secondary tympanic membrane, which fills the uh, round window. The scale of vestibuli, uh, shown at the arrow, extends through the paralymphatic channels of the vestibule to end at the oval window, which is enclosed by the foot plate of the stapes. Movement of the stapes in the oval window exerts pressure on the perilymph in the scale of vestibuli. Because fluid cannot be compressed, waves of pressure either pass through the cochlear duct, displacing it uh, to enter the scalar tympani, or enter the scalar tympani directly through the helicotrema. The pressure is released from the confined perilymphatic spaces of the cochlea, cochlea by the elasticity of the tympanic membrane, which you'll recall bulges into the uh, air-filled tympanic cavity of the middle ear. So this is a region of the cochlear canal seen at increased magnification, showing the scale of vestibuli, the cochlear duct containing the organ of cordy, and the scale of tympani at the bottom of the field. If we more move more towards the center where the modiolus, that bony core of the uh, cochlea is located, one can make off the osseous uh, spiral lamina, this bone projecting here, that was going to give rise to the basilar membrane, which supports the organ of cordy at this particular location, as indicated uh, by the arrow. So this is that osseous spiral lamina that forms a little shelf of bone that is, uh, sticks out into the coil at two and three-fourths turn of this uh, bony cochlear uh, canal. Now extending up is the vestibular membrane which forms the roof of the uh, cochlear duct here and separates it from the scale of vestibuli. The scale of tympani, as you recall, is here. In the modiolus portion of the bone, these are all neurons, the cell bodies, the perichoria of the uh, spiral ganglion or the spang spiral ganglia of cordy here. So these are the nerve cell bodies that are going to be re receiving impulses from the uh, hair cells which are located here in the organ of cordy. They will be uh, come this way and then their central process will uh, go along in the chain of uh, communication. So this shows uh, in, at increased magnification those subdivisions. The osseous spiral lamina uh, coming here, so this is bone, basilar membrane, and this basilar membrane as well as the vestibular membrane unites with this uh, vascularized uh, connective tissue area here on the inner surface, or the outer surface, excuse me, of this cochlear canal, this region here, which is known as the spiral ligament. Uh, and if you look very, very carefully, one can see a region of uh, epithelium here. This is known as the stria vascularis and is thought to be where endolymph is actually uh, produced here in the cochlea. This is a high-powered view of the uh, cochlea. So this is the cochlear duct here with the arrow now resides within its lumen. This is filled with endolymph. This would be the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani here. These are the following structures uh, that can be seen. The spiral lamina is coming in this way. So this are, these fibers here, or elements here, is the formation of the cochlear nerve. This is homogeneous structure at the tip of the arrow going across is the basilar membrane. This epithelial, little thin epithelial layer going up here, it actually has two epithelial components to it separated by a thin basement membrane, but it looks like a thin epithelial membrane is the vestibular membrane. This structure here is the tectorial membrane that the hair cells will be embedded into its base. 
these little cell right here, or its nucleus right here at the ba uh, right at the tip of the arrow, let me see if I can adjust the focus of that just slightly, is an inner hair cell. This is the inner tunnel located here. So this would be uh, one of the pillar cells. It's adjacent pillar cells that form the wall and, and sort of outline the uh, inner tunnel. These cells here, the nuclei are located here, but their cytoplasm extends down and sits on the base, basilar membrane, are the outer phalangeal cells. And these are the outer hair cell nuclei here with their apices going up. And this is that little, like a little apical plate supported also by the phalangeal cells. And then the little hairs that are coming off those microvilli of the outer hair cells will now adhere and stick to the base of this uh, tectorial membrane. The microvilli of the inner hair cell will also extend up and attach to the uh, basal part of the tectorial uh, membrane. The remainder of the cells shown in the field of view, these are mainly supporting cells. The cells of Henson are located here, and these are supporting cells of various uh, named individuals uh, uh, in this particular uh, location. If one goes to the lateral wall of this cochlear duct, one can make out, can focus this a little bit, this region here, which is the stria vascularis, that area that is going to produce the endolymph. This is that region of stria vascularis as seen at high magnification. This epithelium is unique amongst epithelia in that it contains intraepithelial capillaries. Uh, a couple which are shown at the tip of the arrow, uh, though they're uh, because of the thickness of this particular section, uh, very hard to uh, make out the details. But nonetheless, this is the stria vascularis, that region of the cochlear duct that is thought to produce the endolymph. This is a rather excellent example demonstrating another organ of corti. The following structures and features can be observed. First of all, the basilar membrane is shown as the tip of the at the tip of the pointer is this thin homogeneous structure. Secondly, the inner tunnel can be observed with its supporting pillar cells. The nuclei are located as now indicated by the pointer and their cytoplasmic extent of course goes up and is now indicated by the pointer. An inner hair cell is shown at the tip of the pointer here, though it's a little bit disrupted, and its supporting inner phalangeal cell would be at this location. But rather, what's rather spectacular on this particular preparation are the outer hair cells, which are located here. This is the nucleus of an outer hair cell. One is shown here, and one is shown here. They are supported in turn by the outer phalangeal cells, which occupy this space and are sitting on the basilar membrane at this location. So these are the outer phalangeal cells. Recall that the outer phalangeal cells sort of have a concavity, which the lower third or so of the outer hair cells actually sit within. From that point, where they join in this uh, membranous structure that they that is also provided by processes from the phalangeal cells, the outer phalangeal cells, that aren't seen. Uh, so they stick up into this little uh, plate. With careful observation and looking at the hair cells, note that one can actually visualize their microvilli extending beyond this plate-like structure, the supporting plate provided by the uh, outer phalangeal cells. Note also that these cells lie within a fluid. A fluid would be residing within the inner tunnel 
within the spaces around and between these cells. So they're supported at the base by the phalangeal cells, but the upper two-thirds, they are literally bathed by a fluid. This is why this little plate is so important here to give them additional support. Again, with extraordinarily careful observation, one can see the tight junctions, how these outer hair cells are tied into the, uh, that little plate-like structure. In actual fact, the tectorial membrane should extend over on top of these. Remember, these little microvilli are embedded into the base of this tectorial membrane, and it's, as this basilar membrane moves, that shearing force uh, on these little microvilli is thought to be the stimulus uh, for hearing, and it's generated into an electrical uh, impulse. And with that in mind, note these very fine thread-like structures. These are actually nerve fibers coursing across beyond the inner tunnel and were on their way to join with the spiral ganglia in the modiolus region of the cochlea. That, uh, those bipolar neurons center, lying in the center of the uh, cochlear region of the bone, that modiolus area. So there are a lot of real uh, sort of spectacular features that can actually be visualized on this one uh, little portion uh, demonstrating the organ of Cordy.